Welcome to our show, Meaning and Motivation, where we explore the many ways we make meaning together and why we do what we do, our motivation. I'm your host, Tim Thompson, and with me today is John C. Lyons. He's a film producer and director. And John, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, first, John, I saw a picture in the newspaper uh, just this past weekend. It was about something going on uh, with a party that you were holding up in Erie. What was that about? Yeah, for our nonprofit, the Film Society of Northwestern Pennsylvania, we had a fundraiser uh, around the Academy Awards. It was Oscar weekend, so we had a nice party, food, drinks, watched the Oscars, picked the winners. Um, it was a really, really great night, still recovering oh, so from you, it. You had people picking the winners and mm -hmm. stuff? As, uh, yeah, absolutely. Many people picked the right winners? Uh, we had one clear winner, but it was down to uh, three or four by the last couple categories. So it was, it was a good night. We had over 100 people there, and everybody right. had a lot of fun. So that was part of the film series of Northwest Pennsylvania. The Film Society. Film mm -hmm. Society. And so there are some things going on in Northwest Pennsylvania with yeah, film. Yeah, definitely. We, um, we started uh, getting our board and everyone um, involved in the fall. Um, and then, you know, we, we run a weekly film series at the Art Museum called Film at the Erie Art Museum. Um, and now we're starting to form committees to, you know, work on helping educate uh, future and current filmmakers in the area, raise funds to, you know, eventually establish a film office um, and things like this, and then, of course, put on film events like we're doing already. Right, and you're putting on some of those at the Erie Art Museum. At the Art Museum. And mm -hmm. are, th are there certain days and times when those go? Or? Sure. It's, it's every Wednesday. We open the doors at 6 o'clock and then start the movie at 7 o'clock. And I curate uh, the film series, so I do um, a little bit up front to introduce the movie. We have dinner there um, and drinks. And then after the movie, we have an open discussion as well mm -hmm. um, because I like the whole social aspect of film so we're kind of building a nice community um, in the region of people that love film. That sounds like a great experience Absolutely. around it, you know, to have the dinner and the film and then the discussion afterwards mm -hmm. it's like the whole experience. Yeah for sure so Wednesday you know is, is film night for sure. So. <laughs> and what distinguishes those films from say a film that you would see up at the cinema? Sure, yeah, I try, one of my main goals is to introduce people to cinema that misses our area because there are a lot of films um, that miss our area. If you look at just the last year, um, which was a great year for film, um, of the top rated films of the year, uh, we only in Erie get something like 25, 30% of those movies. We miss so many movies here. Um, so we want to change that, so I try and curate you know, um, independent films, um, documentaries, foreign language, and then also classics um, in there as well. Um, a nice uh, eclectic mix of movies from all different backgrounds. Do you know why that is that some of the films would not hit Erie? Why they don't come to Erie? That yeah, it's, it's really tough. It, it costs a lot of money for the studios, you know, to do a release. Um, and, and it's just the way that the whole mainstream market is now. It's just more, it makes more business sense to program like a big Hollywood blockbuster on four or five screens instead of, you know, programming a smaller film on even one screen because they're just kind of, they have to look at the bottom line, um, unfortunately. So that's why, you know, series like this, we can really help with um, enriching, you know, the whole uh, area as far as film and getting people, like I said, you know, to see movies that we would otherwise be totally missing here. Right. Do you usually get a pretty good crowd for that Wednesday? Yeah, we do. We just started a uh, film at the Erie Art Museum in the summer, uh, and then we had another season in the fall and we just started our spring one about a month ago um, and our, our attendance has been going up. We get on average about 60, 70 people a night. We just showed last night Anna Karenina, um, which was nominated for four Oscars this year, didn't play in Erie, which is nuts. 
um, and we had 174 people yeah. there. So that was a huge night. We had to turn people away. So yeah. it was, it's been a really big week. So yeah. <laughs> it's exciting. It's very Good. exciting. Good. Now, you don't just curate for the Erie Art Museum mm -hmm. film series, but you also produce and direct films yourself. And that's right. <laughs> What's a producer? What you know? We always see produced by, and then sure. of course we see sometimes multiple. You know, executive producers, producers, executive producer, this producer. producers, this producer. Yeah, um, yeah. A producer. It really depends on what level of a film you're at. Exactly. If you have, um, you know, a big budget film, usually when you see a name like executive producer, that's the money. That's someone who you know provide a lot of money to help that production, and it's um, kind of a perk. You get that credit. Um, a producer can kind of uh, orchestrate the whole production, you know, make sure that the um, different parts of it are working together, deal with more of the business side of it. Um, in an independent level, which is where I'm at, obviously I don't have, you know, millions of dollars at my disposal. Um, a producer I look at as the person that kind of coordinates all the different areas. Um, and then the director, of course, when you're on the set working on the scene, is kind of the person, you know, running the show there. Mm -hmm. Directing the people. Directing the people, yeah. Yeah. Now, how did you get into this? How did you get into making in, films? Into filmmaking? Yeah. Um, well, when I was younger, I always liked to be in front of the camera. Um, and then when I got into grade school, uh, probably around the time of middle school, I, I wasn't a big fan of writing papers. Um, so I would always try and convince my teachers into letting me shoot a video, uh -huh. like a little short story or something, instead of writing a paper. Um, and actually I found out that I would get better grades for that because it requires a lot of effort to, you know, because you kind of have to write, you have to cast, get your costumes or whatever together. Um, and that was a lot of fun. So uh, then I went to college. And I didn't go to college for filmmaking. I went for computer science. But then I, I kind of got back into it with the whole editing aspect because it kind of tied the two together. Um, and then uh, when I met my wife, we started our own company in 2004 called Lion's Den Productions. And we started getting into it, um, you know, very seriously, putting, you know, money into it, casting people that weren't just our friends and entering film festivals and right. stuff like that. And then it got, you know, took on a much, much more of our, our time and effort and passion. And then where, you've had a few films now and, and you get the ideas for these films from somewhere. Is mm -hmm. there, you know, where do you get the ideas? What, what drives the making of a film for you? Sure, most of our films um, I've written myself. Uh, I, I've done a couple shorts that were someone else's ideas. Um, but for me, with, especially with our feature films, once we got into full length features, it, it requires so much of your time um, that it has to be something that you feel really strongly about, something for me like personal um, or something I have a particular passion about or something I feel like I want to make a statement about. Um, so it really does come from, um, you know, some place inside. Like with Schism, our first feature, um, my father and my grandfather, who I grew up, you know, grew up idolizing, looking up to, um, these really strong men that were involved in the community and were war veterans. Um, seeing them later in their years, you know, kind of being stripped away um, of their personalities through Alzheimer's and, and things like that, that had a huge effect on me. Um, mm -hmm. And so with Schism, I wanted to write a story about, you know, someone that was um, in the downward spiral of, of Alzheimer's. Um, right. So, for example, with that one, that's where that story came from. And it was, it, ultimately, it was really... Um, you know, it, it helped me to talk about it because it's one of those illnesses that still people kind of, you know, brush under the carpet. Um, families aren't so forthcoming with mental illness. Um, so it was therapeutic for me and it was also good for, uh, we found like the audiences, like to get people talking, get people to open up. And that was really rewarding to make right. something like that. And cases like that, it's not just 
talking about mental illness, uh, but it's also f coming face to face with our own demise kind of mm -hmm. thing that yeah, is really disturbing scary. and gives you thoughts that you know, typically people like to brush those thoughts under. Huh? Yeah, scary stuff, but um, you know, I I just felt I had to tackle it. Yeah, and then you've had some other films, like a newer film. Uh, that you've done is mm -hmm. there are no goodbyes yeah there are no goodbyes we've um, been working on again they, they seem to take a long time um, when you're in the low budget independent filmmaker realm you wear a lot of hats um, and small crews and so there are no goodbyes we actually spent all of 2012 uh, editing and we did some test screenings we held a couple test screenings uh, in actually last April at Edinburgh University in Cole Auditorium, and then we did a test screening in the, at the Erie Art Museum, and then in Croatia, of all places, Rijeka, Croatia, um, which you can ask about. I can tell you more about that. And then we got feedback from those and kept working on the film, and now uh, the first week of this year, you know, my wife, Dorota, and I, we got to the point of, okay, we've been working on this a long time, we we're, we're gonna stop this this is as far as the movie's <laughs> gonna go now we need to say we're done and start uh you know submitting to film festivals and setting up screenings and getting it out there because we've had people you know following us on this journey of the film and they're they want to see the film right and it's like anything <laughs> else you could go on and on and on trying to perfect it probably could yeah uh -huh. but you know you have to cut the cord at, at some time and and send it out into the world. So. Right. Now that film, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, just grabbed me right away <laughs> with the, you know, here's this guy leading this very average life, and then all of a sudden he gets that surprise <laughs> box, and from there it's like, right. okay, what's going on there? What is going <laughs> what on? What is going what? on? Um, yeah, There Are No Goodbyes is, um, for me, it's a social-political commentary on um, blue-collar America today, um, which I thought Erie was the perfect city to, to set this film in. Um, and Oliver's life, uh, without giving too much away, Oliver um, kind of parallels, I think, some parts of, of America. Uh, at least the way I see it. He's sleepwalking through life. Um, his parents have recently passed, mm -hmm. and uh, they were sick, so he had to take care of them, um, you know, before they, they passed on. So he didn't really have much of a life of his own. Um, his friends are his parents' friends. You know, he hangs out with his friends at the diner. They're all retired, or he plays cards with the ladies or walks at the mall. Yeah, he doesn't really have too much going on. He definitely doesn't have any friends his own age. Um, and then, yeah, this box shows up on his doorstep and um, uh, they, the, the box has notes in it telling him to do these missions. Um, and eventually he meets the person that sends him the box and he finds out uh, he gets kind of a glimpse at the, at the bigger picture. Right, uh, and I think we have a brief film clip of that when he's meeting when the person who sent the box. So mm -hmm. can we go ahead and show that film clip from There Are No Good Boxes? Hello, Mr. Zernicki. My name is Fenders. Let's proceed with the question at hand, shall we? But before we get to that, I'd first like to thank you for all you've done for me. I and all things are in your debt. And you require an explanation as to why I've asked you to complete your task. What is that? Picture in your mind, history is a succession of images, with each image being a single event, bound together but yet residing in a state of separation, with each event occupying its own page, its own world. 
only a part of the bigger picture. Not by direct connection, but merely by association. A disconnected picture book with no cohesive narrative, chaos. But what if one were to see from a more omniscient perspective? One would be able to see how all these seemingly disconnected events, no matter how apparently insignificant, are actually bound together, influencing each other in ways expansive and powerful. Do you understand? You mean sort of like the whole butterfly flapping and swings thing? If we were to take a look at your life, for instance, We just see what you already know about yourself. But if we were to look closer, we begin to see a bigger story, thread sewing together something much more significant. Do you understand? There is a larger point to things, even if we can't see it, but wait, what is my... One must find his purpose and with all the soul, give himself to it. Oh, come on. I mailed an eagle and whistled a song. Your first task set the wheels in motion. Your second has only just taken root. And the third, it will reveal itself in time. You have a role to play in this vision where there is only one good, knowledge, and one evil, ignorance. And now that I've answered your question, I will be going. Answered? Humanity has broken all of it. A world of lazy, lonely, listless beings. Its equilibrium disturbed. Soon the present day order will be rolled up. And a new one laid out in its stead. Together we must rethink and rebuild. You have the ability, Oliver, and now you must fledge. All will be clear in time. I have things to attend to. Good day, Mr. Zodnecki. But wait, what else is in that book? What happens, happens. I will next see you when it is time. Embrace your life and don't fight your evolution. You gotta be kidding me. Wait! So embrace your life and don't fight your evolution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was that about? <laughs> uh, well, Fenris is, is trying to um, get Oliver. Um, by the way, they're both played by local actors. Um, Fenris is played by Fred Williams. He'd never acted before. Um, he does a fantastic job. Um, and Matthew King plays Oliver. This was his first feature film. Um, Matt went to school for filmmaking. Uh, which and he and I went to the same high school, but we didn't know each other, so it was kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, this scene is when they first meet, and Fenris is is giving uh, Oliver kind of a, a glimpse at the bigger picture and trying to motivate him um, to do something more with his life, because as we've talked about before, he's he's just been coasting. Um, and he, he's letting him know that there's much more going on out there and he needs to play a bigger role in the story. Okay, so you've got to shake off that apathy. <laughs> and what was that, something about don't let the profiteers uh, run your life? <laughs> right. is, what, what's, mm -hmm. what's the meaning behind that? Is that to imply that there's like commercial advertising is pulling us from one 
need or desire mm -hmm. to the next. That's what yeah, I mean, Oliver is, uh, you know, he's a, he's a character that lacks ambition um, and motivation and apathy is, is something that, uh, you know, really irritates me personally. Um, you know, I always like having um, something to do and a, and a goal and um, he's, yeah, he's just trying to shake him, you know, and um, get him to, as he says, em embrace his life and not fight his evolution. Right. You know, we need to evolve, we need to keep moving forward. Um, so the movie is about many of those things. Um, as I said, it's it's kind of a look at, at America um, today and, uh, you know, how maybe we shouldn't be, um, maybe we should, it's okay to embrace change and evolution because you can't stay stagnant. Right, you certainly can. And is that a problem in America that many people, and if we do become apathetic, is it because of the pressures of are we Many products things. of our environment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a lot of pressures around us to, um, you know, just be comfortable in our in our havens, you know, and and not. Um, but I think that's I don't think that's healthy. Obviously, um, you know, I, I think it's good to explore things and meet new people and um, other cultures and and things like that. So. Yeah, it, it comments on, on a lot of those things, and I think it is, it is a problem. You know, we, we are more open with technology and things like that, but also in a way we're kind of more closed off um, to one another. Right. So. And this, when you say other cultures and people, it, part of this was in Croatia? Well, we or? actually we filmed, um, obviously, in Erie, Pennsylvania, but we also filmed um, in Ireland and the Czech Republic and in Poland. Right. Um, so there's scenes uh, that involve the organization that Fenris is part of. Um, we wanted to give kind of a look of that global picture, just a little peek. Yeah. Um, so there, there are scenes that we filmed in those three countries as well that um, tie into the. So the you did story. actually go there to film. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. had to bring some of your talent over there to do that. Yeah, actually, uh, we they were um, friends of ours that we knew that were in these countries. We didn't actually we did okay, it as so low budget as we could. <laughs> um, we brought a camera, and our crew was just my wife and I, just Dorota and I and um, whoever was going to be in the scene. And I had, of course, sent them the script ahead of time, and I storyboarded stuff out as much as I could. Right. Um, because, like, in Ireland, for example, um, I, I knew I wanted to film on the Cliffs of Moher over the ocean, um, mm -hmm. so we got on a, a ferry boat um, in the ocean to get shots up on the cliff. But it's not like I told anybody that was on the boat. You know, they thought I was just a tourist just filming these cliffs. Um, and then when we filmed in Ireland, um, <clears throat> there's this one section on the cliffs that's really dangerous and it doesn't have um, like a guardrail or anything. So we wanted to film over there because it looks more impressive. So we hopped over <laughs> over this sign that says, don't, don't cross go past here. here. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went out there and it was just my wife and I for that. My wife actually um, plays a role in the movie. Uh -huh. And I set her out there and we're both nervous, but we filmed it and got the shot. And, you know, it's crazy, but you can do that stuff when you're independent. Did you have in mind to do that shot on the Cliffs of Moore before you even went there? You used to said, okay, we got to have this. Mm -hmm. But then as you got there, did ideas start to come up for, okay, how are we going to shoot that? What's going to be the angle? For sure, respect? because, um, yeah, there, there are scenes that led up to that those cliffs. We knew we wanted to have her um, get in contact with um, Fenris somehow. So we needed to find a location. So we found a bar that was like, or a pub that was really close to the cliffs. Um, and then when we filmed in Poland, we just walked in downtown Lublin. Um, right out on the streets with the actors and, and just let them roll with it. It's it's a lot of fun filming like that. You don't have to, you know, worry about really anything. That's kind of nice to work that into your film, too, because mm -hmm. then you get the perks of traveling Absolutely. and filming. And yep. My wife's Polish. She's from Poland, so we went to her hometown. So that one was easy. Um, and then the Czech Republic, we always wanted to go to Prague. Yeah. And I had friends there, so we said... You know, we we can film these other scenes in Prague. So it's really when you're an independent filmmaker, 
um, you know, you have to utilize every tool and connection you have because you just don't have the money to, you know, send a whole crew out to Poland and film, you know, you just can't do it. So right. you really have to improvise and, and those challenges are really fun. Yeah. And you've kind of learned over the years how to make do with what you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, in your first film, Sch was Schism. Schism your first major film? That was our first feature, yeah, our first full length. Full length. Mm -hmm. And how long did that take to make? It took, uh, it was 50 filming days, but it was over the course of a year because we wanted to film all of the seasons mm -hmm. um, to show kind of the cycle of life as well. And we filmed in an operational nursing home, Brevalier Village, which was amazing and uh, crazy at the same time because it's an operational facility. You know, that one we had to get releases from all of the extras and stuff, but it gave us this authenticity. Um, you know, when we're filming, the people that are in the background of the scenes, a lot of them are, are you know, real people that mm -hmm. are residents um, in this place. And, uh, yeah, we, we learned a lot, learned how to improvise and yeah. fix a lot of problems that come up. Now, I mentioned that schism was kind of disturbing. It was kind of, you know, coming face to face with your demise and mm -hmm. whatever. How did that, how did that evolve? What was the... Yeah, the, the, well, like I said, the story started from with my father, and it was really just, um, you know, at attacking this great fear. I mean, for me, the scariest thing is to lose m my own mind, you know, mm -hmm. to lose control of your own thoughts. That, to me, is the scariest thing I can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was, I had to write a story about it. So um, mm -hmm. we filmed there. And, you know, you always see a lot of films, um, well, you don't see a lot of films about Alzheimer's anyhow, but when you do, they usually show it from the perspective of a family member on the outside mm -hmm. and the effect it has on them to have someone in their family with this disease. Um, but I wanted to show it from the perspective of the person inside. Uh, I had a lot of conversations with my dad about the hallucinations and things that he saw. Um, he was really uh, forthcoming with me with that information when he could be. And um, so I tried to integrate uh, a lot of that stuff in there to make it as real as possible. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we, we have scenes, you know, that depict his mind's downward spiral. And as you're watching the story um, come out, and he has contact with his family on the outside, um, you know, you're not quite sure if everything he's telling them and seeing is really happening. And that was really like watching the unraveling of meaning or purpose in someone's life because, you know, like you say, you, you start to lose your mind and that's a big part of your life, your memory, mm -hmm. essentially. But then when your family starting to lose your family, in fact, we have a clip here of when he's starting to realize that his family is... Yeah, his because because he's in you know he has a schism in that he's living in um, this long-term care facility, um, and then the whole outside world is still going on, obviously. And he has daughters um, and granddaughter, a uh, granddaughter, and their lives are moving on. And so this scene that we're going to show is when his one daughter um, uh, is telling him that she's going away for for college and that really has an, an effect on him because you know he already doesn't see them a lot he's already in this place um, depressed and lonely and but you know people have to go on with their lives so that's a that's obviously a, a big hit for okay. him so let's take a look at that dad Hey, Dad? Yes. What? You're okay in here, right? I have to get out of here. Can't you see? See what, Dad? Nothing. Never mind. Dear, when can I go home? My hip's feeling better. You know I want to do something. But you gotta talk to Kathy about that. There's nothing I can do.
Remember when I applied for that exchange program last semester? Yeah. I got accepted. Well, that's good. Thanks. Yeah, it'll only be for like a term. I'll be back before summer. Be back? Yeah. Where are you going? It's in Oregon. Oregon? What about me? I'll be back before you know it. Besides, you got, you got people here. You know, Kathy, Tim, Kelly. They'll come to visit you. Oh, they're not going to come and visit. Oh, come on. They care about you. They want to see you out of here just as much as I do. And I'll, I'll write to you. I'll call you. Call me? Yeah, I'll call you. What about Sam? We're still together. Nothing's changed there. I just, I have to get out of here, you know? I have to see something new. I have to meet new people. You understand more than anybody else I know. I've been here all my life. It's just, it's time. And I'll be back so soon. I'm going to miss you. I'll miss you too. It's getting cold out. Do you want to go back in? Yeah. So that really is, that whole story is like this series of like a downward spiral into demise. Yeah, into and, losing your mind, dementia. And here she's kind of letting him know that, I'm dad, I'm going. And, yeah. Yeah. So, and that, that movie doesn't really end on a happy note, right? No, I mean, yeah, I... Right, without giving it away, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a hard story to tell. It's not like you're going to have a cure at the end or, or something like that. Um, by the end, I tried to uh, show that there was acceptance there. He had acceptance in what was going on because he was fighting it for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and there was always that, you know, that pushback. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And something you mentioned about uh, wanting to get the Four Seasons mm -hmm. in Erie as you do that. So are those, when you're making a film, there's not just the concern for the, the story, mm -hmm. the on-screen drama that's going on, but some other? Yeah, when I write, uh, especially with Schism, when I write it, there was going to be a lot of repetition um, because, you know, you get into these patterns, um, you know, in long-term care and assisted living, there's, you know, these daily activities, and, and we all, obviously, we all have it in our lives as well. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to show those cycles. There's some cycles in the movie, and the most obvious one was, was the weather, just to kind of show, you know, when he first got in there, it was spring, and then he met um, his friends inside the facility. It was a, it was a happier mm -hmm. time. He had some bonds in summer. Um, but then the fall and the winter, um, you know, obviously tying into into the latter parts of, of the story. Right. And then just the whole loss of independence. Yeah. And then, but then with that, uh, like you mentioned, the interdependence of meeting the friends and mm -hmm. making the friends in there yeah. and everything. So. Yeah, because, um, you know, being there for so many days, 50 days, I mean, you know, we really got to know a lot of the residents in there and, and some great people and personalities. And, yeah, there's cliques and, you know, groups and clubs. And, um, you know, they have activities and, and things to do all the time. So it was, yeah, it was really interesting to, um, you know, kind of be residents ourselves there for a year. We were there all the time, all hours of the day. Right. So... So there, there's not just, uh, so you're making these films, but that's not the only activity because you're submitting them for film festivals mm -hmm. and such. And what's, what's that like? What's that whole uh, game involved? Yeah, film festivals are, are really interesting and costly. Um, it's very difficult uh, to make the top tier film festivals now, like your Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, mm -hmm. Berlin, um, Venice. Uh, you pay anywhere, just to give you a little background on festivals, 
Um, some of them are free, none of the big ones are. Um, the big ones cost anywhere from $50, $60 to like $300 to submit to. So you pay the fee, you send your movie in. Um, Sundance gets something like seven, 8,000 movies and they pick 70. Wow. Um, and most of the ones that they pick star name talent, you know, A-list, B-list, even C-list, because it's, it's very um, hard to market movies. There's so many movies out there. Um, so the top tier festivals, if you can make one top tier film festival, you know, you're, you're set, that's awesome. Um, so we send to the top tier, which we um, just sent to a few for their no goodbyes. Um, but we really now look for um, places that have a really good reputation, um, that really appreciate true independent voices and true independent filmmakers. Um, because there is a difference. You'll hear independent film being thrown out a lot. Um, like, for example, Beasts of the Southern Wild was a real independent film. Um, but if you have an independent film like Little Miss Sunshine that stars Steve Carell and had a $30 million low budget, right. you know, yeah. not the same, not the same thing at all. Um, but they're in the same category. So it is really, really competitive. Um, so now what a lot of filmmakers are doing and what we're doing ourselves is, sure, we're sending to the festivals because that's still the, the best chance, bang for your buck. You spend you know, hundreds, thousands of dollars trying to get into these festivals, but they'll do, you know, some marketing for you and you get to play in a theater and, you know, usually in front of a good crowd. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying for. But then also we're looking at um, self-distribution strategies and a lot of filmmakers um, that are even at a much more um, higher level of success than us that have made Sundance and these other festivals, they're doing this themselves. Um, where you can uh, form partnerships with either independent theater houses or even a lot of them, they'll put their movie right online and just you can just watch or buy it right there and most of the money will go back to the filmmaker. So mm -hmm. there's really no rules now. It used to be, you know, you had to go through a festival and then someone would buy it and then it would be in a theater or on video you shows. You had to get it stuff. actually printed and mm -hmm. distributed. But now with online venues, yep. you can go direct. Yeah, you can you can do it yourself. You really can. And it really is um, more up to the filmmaker, but then you have that control as well to kind of control your own destiny, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at this summer, um, we'll have it available on DVD. You can stream it through our website. And we're also working on setting up some screenings um, around the states and, and wherever else. Great. Yeah. Wow. So that'll be available uh, streaming from your website, so people will be able to pay to download it to watch. Yep. They can either go to thereanogoodbyes.com mm -hmm. or schismmovie.com. We'll have both of the films that we're talking about today out there. Okay. So if, if someone wanted to get into filmmaking, mm -hmm. like, like you've done, is it all that difficult? I mean, what are some of the... Yeah, now, nowadays, definitely not. I mean, you can get editing software on your computer. Every computer comes with really basic editing software. You know, you can either use iMovie if you have an Apple or mm -hmm. Movie Maker if you have a Windows PC. Um, or you can get Premiere or Final Cut or whatever you'd like. So the editing software is there. Cameras, you know, you can shoot right through a digital SLR still camera. Now you can shoot HD video, um, or you can get a video camera for a few thousand dollars. Um, yeah, it's really, um, you know, it's all kind of changing the market and the rules, and it's exciting. A lot of the filmmakers, um, like the bigger filmmakers, use a lot of digital cameras, and, and you know, it's kind of like overlapping as far as the tools that people right. use. And why make films? Why make films? I think uh. film is um, the perfect art form for me. It really combines everything. Writing, theater, um, you can look at cinematography and lighting as kind of painting, um, you know, music, uh, editing, the marketing aspect of it all. It really, film for me encompasses um, all of the arts. And so for me, it's the perfect art form. 
Um, it's the perfect art form for our times now. Um, it's a good way to convey, you know, emotion and and uh, passions and ideas. And as you said, it's a way to work out certain things or to express something for, mm. for you that, 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 you know, in the case of uh, Alzheimer's and stuff, not many people are really expressing or talking about. Right. So, and why, why watch films? Why, <laughs> what's... I, I, yeah, I, I watch a lot of films. Um, for me, I didn't go to film school, so the way I learn is by watching, you know, the masters and how they work and watching, um, you know, just watching as much as I can, new and old, um, learning techniques, seeing how they do it. You know, the extra features on DVDs and Blu-rays are great for me because I can see how, you know, the director set up certain shots and, and things like that. Um, and then you just get out there and, and do it, you know? You just l watch and learn and, um, you know, find your own voice and your own style and and, and go with it. So, um, yeah, I, I watch a lot of film. It's it's important to watch a lot of film, I think. For me. Are, there, are there certain elements to your voice and your style that you see evolving as you go from film to film? Uh, um, I, th I think so, I mean, I, I think, you know, as we've talked about now just today, there are obviously some overlapping things as far as purpose and motivation um, in one's life. Uh, those are definitely some recurrent themes. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm curious to see how the third film will go and the fourth and the fifth and see, um, you know, kind of how we evolve as filmmakers. And um, yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, I've only made two feature films and um, five short films, so I'm, I'm still finding, um, you know, my style and my voice, but, um, you know, there are no goodbyes I'm really proud of, um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's the next step for us, so. Yeah, well, it's great to see that kind of <laughs> independent filmmaking going on around here and that they're Definitely. involved in that, so. Good, and it really is, it's, it's nice to find a thriving uh, group around film, you know, viewing films, making films, and that interest in the eerie area. So. Yeah, Northwestern Pennsylvania is really, you know, with the, the f forming of the Film Society, that's, that's what we want to help is, is all of that. Um, you know, I just kind of did things on my own, but, you know, looking at it now, if there was that support network there that could help me, you know, get locations and the tools I needed and, um, you know, meet filmmakers and hear them speak and, and things like that and see films, have access to films other than, you know, like Transformers 3 or whatever <laughs> at the theater. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's very beneficial for filmmakers out there what we're working to do, so. Right, and hopefully that continues to grow. Yeah, Not absolutely. Just in the Erie area and Edinburgh University as well. Yeah, so. definitely. Well, this has been thrilling to bring you, and, and good luck. I can't wait to see your next film and watch how <laughs> that you. takes off. All right, John C. Lyons, thanks for being with us. Thanks so much. Take care. Yeah, thank you.